Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Glad Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today I'm joined by Keith. Keith, can you please share a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, thanks for having me on your show. My name is Keith Sonderling. I'm the commissioner of the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Washington, D.C., uh, for those of you who don't know, the EEOC is the federal agency responsible for enforcing all workplace laws that prevent discrimination and promote equal employment opportunity in the workplace. So when you think about my agency, you think about the big ticket employment items like the diversity, equity, inclusion, Me Too movement, age discrimination, religious discrimination across the board. Um, uh, that is my my current role uh, before mm -hmm. joining the EEOC. I was the deputy and acting administrator at the wage and hour division at the U.S. Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. um, and then before that, I was in private practice in Florida as a labor and employment attorney. Excellent. Thank you, Keith, for sharing your background and what you do. Now, I want to ask you about remote work. The EOC has been making some interesting moves recently in remote work. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those legal cases and what are the implications might be? Yeah, well, I think it's um, you got to take a step back and see mm. where we are with remote work uh, okay. post pandemic, because if you think about before the pandemic, and I know this is what you specialize in the amount of statistics of those who are remote workers or not, mm -hmm. suddenly, in a sense, everyone became a remote worker. Yep. And there's um, a lot of legal issues surrounding the whole remote work world mm. that people don't really dive into because there's a lot of misunderstanding. So think about it first. Where is there a right to work remotely? And you really, for most employees, there is no right mm -hmm. to legally work remotely. Now, post-pandemic, when everyone was forced to work remotely, everyone for the first time um, was home, working in their pajamas, working in their basement, working alongside pets and family members. And what happened? There was a lot of record-breaking productivity, you know, employee experience and happiness. So in that push to get everyone home, if you remember early, you know, stop the spread, everyone stay home, yeah. you know, is a, is a temporary thing. What happened was everyone in, in knowledge working jobs, look, some jobs you can't work from home, you know, retail, manufacturing, logistics, um, suddenly became um, remote workers, which we hadn't really seen in, in mass scale before. But in that, and my point is, the what was lost about who was in control from a legal mm -hmm. perspective about, not a policy perspective, not a business perspective, which mm -hmm. I know a lot what you focus on, sure. um, about who's in control of that. So when you have the whole employee experience occurring, saying, well, if you change our workplace condition now after working from home for two or three years, we're just going to quit. We're going to go find another job with your competitor who's offering a remote job that in some cases is paying more. So the dynamic shifted between, you know, who's in charge versus what employees mm -hmm. want. And what was lost is that, and this is a legal term, that employers still control the essential function of the job. Mm -hmm. So from a legal perspective, we're just and I'm going to get in, break it down. Sure. But from a straight legal perspective, if an employer says part of your job description, part mm -hmm. of the quote essential functions of your job is for being in the office five days a week, even though you could do that job from home more efficiently, more economically, and will make more money you working at home, they are allowed to do that, right? Mm -hmm. There's really no protected yeah. right to federal to telework. Where did we see that before? In collective bargaining agreements. Mm -hmm. And then some executive employment contracts, you think about it, the vast majority of employees in the United States don't have those executive level contracts where they have specific terms where they can work from home. So for other than that, we never saw any legal right. But what has happened now with the rush to return to the office mm -hmm. is you're seeing employees starting to have a federally protected right to remote work. Mm. And where does that come from? That comes from employers, in some senses, rushing employees back to the office too quickly without facing mm. the realities of the new working environment. Mm. Because here's what happened during the pandemic. People got comfortable not being around other people. People yeah. got comfortable in their current situations. And what we also saw was the rise 
of workplace mental health discussions where mm-hmm. everyone from CEOs to having an open culture about mental health. Mm-hmm. So now what we're seeing is, and, and you know, I know you've written about this, all the pushes to return to the office, whether it's from the CEO saying, everyone needs to be back in the office. Mm-hmm. You're never going to succeed in this organization unless you're back in the office um, to just a general wanting for togetherness, right? So before, when you say, okay, everyone needs to be in the office five days a week, three days a week, four days a week. Um, if you didn't show up to the office, then that amount of time, you'd be fired, period, mm-hmm. right? And But now we're saying, well, I don't want to return to the office because I don't want to deal with the commute. Mm-hmm. No legal protections, right? I don't want to return to the office because I can't get doggy daycare on Tuesdays and mm-hmm. Wednesdays and I have to be home with my dogs. No legal protections. I can't come into the office with your return to office mandate because I'm anxious about Mm -hmm. going on, returning to my previous life. I have depression thinking about having to be at the water cooler Mm -hmm. and chat with my colleagues all day. Uh, I have PTSD about re-entering the workforce and everything that happened during COVID. Now, you know, I can't go back to, or what we're seeing in a lot of cities, I'm anxious about riding on the subway now because I may get the next strand of the next virus yeah. or crime is rising in a lot of cities. I'm anxious. That's giving me anxiety and that's impacting my mental health about returning to the office. Mm-hmm. Well, now it's a totally different story. Okay. Mm. So, but that is going to require employees coming forward under the mm-hmm. Americans with disability act and saying, I can't return to the office because of a mental health issue. I'm mm-hmm. going to seek professional help and be diagnosed with a mental health condition under the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm now disabled under the ADA. And now, employer, you mm-hmm. have to accommodate me. Okay. No mm-hmm. matter how ridiculous that mm-hmm. may sound to that hiring manager for the reasons of why they don't want to come back into the office, if mm-hmm. it's related to a mental health condition, then the employer has to engage in that interactive process. And my fear and why I've been talking about the legal issues related to return to work, even though, as you aptly point out in your research, the vast majority of those issues related to are related to business efficiency, right? Sure. Uh, but now, you know, you're starting to see the legal issues is yeah. because if employers, HR departments are under such pressure by their boards, by their C-suites, because don't forget, um, chief human resources officers, HR managers, they're employees too, right? And if their boss is saying, we want everyone back in the office five days a week, we want everyone back in the office four days a week, no exceptions. We don't want to hear the excuse. Mm -hmm. If HR is not able to do what it does best, what it is required to do under the law, which is engage in the interactive Mm -hmm. process. If the reason that employee says they can't come back to work is related to a mental health condition, Mm -hmm. you're done. There's no defense. You violated the Americans with Disability Act on its face. So that's, you know, before I get into some of the statistics of how these claims are rising, that's my number one concern Mm -hmm. to everyone listening and engaged in the return to office conversation. Not that Mm -hmm. you can't have mandatory RTO policies, not that you can't make that business decision. The EEOC is going to allow you Mm -hmm. to do that. But if you are requiring workers to come back, the workers who have disabilities, whether physical, obviously we know Mm -hmm. a lot of, about or mental health disabilities, which you know can potentially encompass um, now alcoholism, um, mm. rehabilitation from drug use, substance abuse. Look, the, the mm. amount of substance abuse that occurred during the pandemic. There's a lot of statistics sure. on how it increased. So people may be in you know recovery programs as well. So it's more expensive. If you're not engaging in the interactive process, mm. your, your policies are going to go down um, just based on that. And look. Mm. There's also fear about, well, if we engage in the interactive process, it's going to be tough to combat. And then the employee is always going to work from home. So now our fear is that we have these return to office mandates. Mm. We All these employees are going to come forward and request mental health accommodations, you know, go to their doctor, say mm. they have anxiety, say they have depression, right? Um, and then they're going to just all want to work from home. And that fear is unfounded. And let me tell you why. Because the reality of it is why the Americans with Disability Act is such a unique law, because Mm -hmm. there's no one size fits all approach 
to ADA accommodations. So you may be requesting an accommodation for a mental health illness that I have too, but we have completely separate um, accommodation procedures because mm. they're all different, right? And that's why working with the medical provider is so critical in that sense <laughs> um, because everyone's different. So although generally the employees, and I'm not trying to generalize, but let's just assume that the number one request is to related to mental health is to not come to the office. Sure. Well, you know, HR departments, if they're engaging in an interactive process, if they're working with their mental health provider or their doctor, they will mm -hmm. see that all the ailments are different. All the potential accommodations are different. Mm -hmm. So other examples may be, well, okay, you still have to come to the office, but because you have this type of depression, you know, it requires you to take a break once, you know, an hour to walk outside or we're going to put you in a low light situation uh, area, or we're going to give you Bose noise canceling headsets. So you're not distracted, but you can get that granular instead of having a fear that if I engage in this conversation, it's just going to lead to remote work, which is just going to then be on my performance as you know, an HR professional. And that's sort of what I'm trying to demystify mm -hmm. is that it's not the accommodation is not always going to be um, having to work remote all the time. It may be, it's yeah. just, you don't know that unless you engage in it. And that's, what's so critical. And with these mass mandates to come back, you can't skip those steps. Let me tell you about the second mm -hmm. part that I also fear about return to office policies that can lead to lawsuits yeah. from the EEOC. So let's say now a team has been working remotely since 2020, but it's mm -hmm. 2024. Now let's say in the tech industry, all of our programmers need to come back to the office. So we're a group of 10 coders at like this level, right? Just hypothetically, of course. So um, we've been doing our jobs great from home, but now we have to come back. So everyone comes back to the office and then, you know, the typical complaints now about coming to the office and now we're just sitting on Zoom meetings anyway all day. Mm -hmm. But out of that 10, the other seven notice that three of their colleagues who do the same exact work they do are not there. So they go to the, the their their boss. You know, a lot of times bosses are not trained HR professionals, right? Sure. And they say, you know, why why is he working from home? Why is she working from home? That's not fair. We literally do the same exact thing, and mm. we're zooming with them, and they're in their pajamas in their basement, hanging out, and here we are having travel forty minutes to the office to sit on Zoom doing the same thing, right? And look, as you just heard, those people may have had unique issues, physical mm -hmm. or mental, that they got, they went through the accommodation process. The employer accommodated them with their healthcare provider for that specific issue. And that was the accommodation they got. But mm -hmm. the ADA also protects, you know, the disclosure of that medical information. Yep. So if you have an untrained, you know, uh, manager, not even an HR saying, well, you know, yeah, he gets to work from home because he's crazy now, right? Uh or she's yeah. she working from home. I know it's not fair. I know we're doing the, 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 the same exact work, but the, you know, they went to some doctor and, sh and she, or he said they're depressed and now they get to work mm. and there's nothing I can do about it. And I completely agree with you. Mm. That's it. That's another violation right there. So you see, it's so much more than just the interaction with the HR department. It's a, it's a training throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. that the new reality is in this hybrid work in, environment that it's not all necessarily business related of why some people get to work, that there may be some other sensitive reasons that you can't dive into because that can also be a violation of the employee's medical privacy. So you can see how these sort of things um, spiral out of control in that sense. But <laughs> that's sort of the overriding you know, legal principles and messages that I feel has gotten lost in all of this. And because mm -hmm. it's become such a popular topic, because employees are demanding it, um, because you know they want that flexibility, employers in a sense who now are looking at what their options are to go back to the way it was if they want to do that. And of course, not all employers are doing this. Sure. You, know, you can't lose sight that yes, you are in control, but that comes with certain significant legal requirements if an employee is going to object for it based upon um, disability grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really insightful and really covers in depth the kind of training that is necessary. And that's, I actually 
it reminds me of some of the training sessions I do and some of the train questions that leaders, bosses ask me. It's like, oh, well, if I have to give this person the accommodation, won't it be fit unfair to the other people on the team? So what do you do? How do you respond to concerns about unfairness? And you know, some you know, employee who is going to say, well, I'm going to go try and do that. Like, how do you respond to that? What what would you say to HR professionals who are concerned that if some employees start doing that, other employees will copy them? You're going to have to deal with it. And that's really mm -hmm. tough. And it's just that you, you can't just have these um, blanket policies saying, mm -hmm. well, you are not allowed to then make an accommodation yourself because we don't trust the reasons you're doing it because you found out now. And that's even where it gets yeah. more complicated yep, yep, because yep. then you're going to get an influx of these claims. And that is why you, you know, employers are still in a position where they can question if they want to go down this road. And look, we saw this during the va mandatory vaccination times. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you put the return to office aside for a second, HR had to deal with this when everyone wanted an exemption to the man company's mandatory vaccination yeah. policies. And a large part, why were you seeing a lot of these objections? Is because if they weren't vaccinated, maybe they can continue to work from home. Maybe they didn't can have to work around other people in the sense. And it was the same thing because like disability, religion is so individualized. You know, the, the state legal standard mm -hmm. for religion is a sincerely held religious belief. So you and I may sure. be of the same faith, but we have completely different beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that, and just like a disability, we may have the same disability, but how we're able to perform the essential functions of our job with an accommodation, and sorry to be very legal, um, may vary. And, and, and sure. that's what employers dealt with during the COVID vaccination, where the first time is they had to get in the business if they wanted to questioning their employer's faith. And do they really want to go down that whole of saying, well, are you really religious? Do we believe that you believe in the scripture you're citing to get that um, it be exempted under the religious exemption for the uh, vaccination policy? So that's sort of the same area we're in now where it's up to the company in a sense, how much resources do you want to invest in this? Do you want to just, you know, have a, a policy where you engage in the process and you believe that the individual is disabled and you don't require additional medical certifications? Um, or do you believe the employee is religious without having to um, question it further? Or do you want to get in the business of questioning that meant to, that disability, getting additional certifications, which you're absolutely allowed to do, go to in, going to an independent doctor and to, to have them evaluated yourself. Because again, like I said, the, the severity of this is the employee is saying they're disabled, right? Uh, you, you should, and, and you can't take that lightly and nor should the employee making um, that claim. So the, the bottom, the tough portion of this is that if somebody goes in bad faith to request an accommodation and, and they're not, you know, applicable for that, you know, if they're not diagnosed or if they're diagnosed and you're questioning that, you're allowed to do that. But then look how much time, effort, and money you're spending with each individual employee yeah. doing that opposed to, I think, and I'm not advocating for any business decisions here where a lot of your writing and a lot of the thought leadership in the return mm -hmm. to work area is of saying, well, you, you sort of avoid that by making this whole accommodations, you know, individually with the more creative mm -hmm. works. Uh, such scenarios with your own individual employees. So the, the long answer uh, and legal answer to your question is, is that if you're going to get those influx of accommodation requests, after you have that accommodation, HR managers can only say, we can't talk about any other employees, individual um, employment. There's policies and procedures in place relating to accommodations, speak to HR, and then HR has to take that fresh. So again, you see where it now turns into a business decision on the HR side of how much time, effort, and resources. And we saw that during the pandemic. If some um, employee said, I want an, uh, an exemption to the vaccine because of my religion, you were granted without further inquiry, right? So you're going to see the balance here of saying, well, I have a mental health issue I want this accommodation. It's up to the employer then to go forward. Because if obviously if they granted it, there's nothing more to do. They engage in the interactive sure. process and they gave the employee what they want. And that's where I go to the flip side too. And um, a site you're probably familiar with, um, Department of Labor's Job Accommodation Network, jan.org or .gov. Really, 
gives very granular advice, not just for mental health disabilities, but every type of ailment, physical or illness, they give employers very, you just click on the disability and it gives you potential accommodations where the employee can work with that disability without potentially creating an undue hardship for that employer. And again, not to sound too legal, there's still an analysis employers have to do with saying, you know, even with the accommodation is the employer able to employee able to do the job with remote work. Obviously they've been doing it. It's a much harder mm -hmm. to prove, but even like, so say I, 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 I have a diagnosed with anxiety, uh, employers can go on job and accommodation network, click on the anxiety and see the multitude of different types mm -hmm. of accommodations they can offer in addition to remote work that may be able to, for them to perform their job. Excellent. And as we finish up, just so that people understand who don't understand what could be the consequence of this sort of violation, if the employer doesn't actually play ball with the employee, maybe it can go into a current EOC case or give a hypothetical one, just so that employers understand the kind of consequence that might result from them not actually proceeding in this manner with a case where an employee has a mental or physical disability. Well, well, let's just start on the top and obviously all hypothetical, though we did have sure. a case which you've um, written about um, where an employee was denied a remote, um, where it would have been reasonable to give an accommodation to allow that employee to remote uh, work remotely, and the employer unreasonably denied it, and um, you know it resulted in a monetary fine in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. But hypothetically, you know, and and my fear of this, and why you know I'm glad we're talking, you know, as you being a thought leader in this area, is that I, I can't express enough how no matter the pressures to get people back to the office, no matter your policy. If you want a full five-day return to the office policy, it's a free country, outside of collective bargaining agreement, outside any contractual obligations, do it. But you, if there is a request related to mental health or physical, a physical disability um, to HR, you, you have to go through it. As ridiculous as the request may seem, even if you don't believe or trust the employee's motives for wanting mm -hmm. to suddenly, you know, claim a mental health illness to be able to work from home, you have to do that analysis mm -hmm. and engage in that interactive process and ask the employee tough questions. If you want, ask the employee for that medical certification, work with the employee's uh, mental health care provider, and then come to a term that balances out and it allows, look, the standard is to work, you know, with an accommodation as if they would be able to work without that disability. So to get to that point, whether it's a combination of remote work or it's fully remote work, whether it's different hours or, you know, there's just hundreds of different, it's so case specific. If you don't engage in that process, because everyone needs to be back in the office on January 1st, there's no defense. And that's, that's really where we've seen before in these types of situations where it's policies going into effect on this day, if you don't like it, you're fired. Hmm. It's different here. It just, it doesn't work here. And the other part of it too, the second layer of this is when you're administering these policies, you have to be careful of who you're granting these work from home policies for. Let's now put mental health aside for a minute. So say we're going to say, okay, well, if you're in this group, you know, you can work from home all the time, but these two groups, we don't trust as much. You're back in the office, right? Well, you have to look at about what the um, protected class demographic breakdown of those groups mm -hmm. are, because the last thing you want is a lawsuit saying remote work is a benefit now. And we're not getting that benefit because we are in this protected class. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing, you know, sometimes the trustworthiness of, of some groups, you know, if, if managers have bias in there, they're saying, well, we don't trust people from this country. So if you're from this country, um, you're back in the office. But if you're from, you know, this country or you're male or you're female or you're black or you're white or you're Asian, Hispanic, you know, just name the protected characteristic. You don't want to have a disparate impact on certain mm -hmm. groups and then a claim saying, well, all men get to work remotely mm -hmm. and all women, you know, just by the types of jobs they're in, I have to come to the office. So as simple as that, ensuring that there's no impact in those policies and, uh, and, in, and 
also too, with even getting in the door of saying like, look, if you, if you're a man, if you make a request to work from home, you're going to get it. But if you're female, we're not even going to, you know, we're going to mm. put you through the interactive process. If it's mental health, you could see just that simplistic. And I'm not, you know, those are obviously ridiculous, very blatant yeah. examples, but it still happens. And you could see that has nothing to do with mental health. That's just on the impact of returning these, these policies. And I, I know there's a lot of, um, writings about who's being impacted by remote work, who's being impacted by returning to the office. Um, if not, it's going to impact caregivers. Um, you know, there's just a whole different groups. So just be mindful of the impact on the various groups when you're, when you're doing these plans. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. This was super helpful. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show.